This is a story about a man who may have caused more harm to the earth than any other single human in history. But it started with good intentions. His name was Thomas Midgley Jr., a mechanical engineer with a knack for chemistry. In the 1920s, engines were noisy and inefficient. They knocked when gasoline combusted unevenly. Midgley found a chemical solution, tetraethyl lead. It reduced knocking and it worked brilliantly. So they added lead to gasoline. Problem solved, right? Except lead is toxic. Even small amounts can damage the brain, especially in children. Midgley even held a press conference. He inhaled leaded gasoline vapor to prove it was safe. Soon after, Midgley took time off due to lead poisoning. Despite warnings from scientists, the lead industry pushed on. Money talked louder than safety. For decades, children worldwide breathed in tiny particles of lead from car exhaust. Lead exposure was linked to lower IQ, attention problems, and long-term harm. By the 1970s, scientists began to fight back. But it wasn't until the 1990s that leaded gasoline was banned in most countries. By then, it had poisoned an entire generation. Midgley went on to invent more things, like CFCs, which also ended up harming the planet. He meant well, but his inventions had unintended consequences beyond imagination. Today, Thomas Midgley Jr. is remembered not as a villain, but as a cautionary tale. Progress isn't always forward, and sometimes one person's solution becomes everyone's problem. Marie Curie is one of the most celebrated scientists in history. She discovered two new elements, polonium and radium, both dangerously radioactive. But at the time, radioactivity was still a mystery. No one really understood how dangerous it was. In fact, glowing radium was sold in toothpaste, beauty cream, and even tonic water. Curie carried radioactive vials in her pockets and stored them in her desk drawer. She believed her discoveries could help mankind. She won two Nobel Prizes, one in physics, one in chemistry. But behind the accolades, her health was quietly deteriorating. She suffered from fatigue, cataracts, and chronic pain. Years of unprotected exposure had taken a silent toll. Eventually, she developed aplastic anemia, a condition linked to radiation damage. She passed away in 1934, never knowing the full extent of what radiation had done. To this day, her old notebooks remain dangerously radioactive. Visitors to her papers must wear protective gear. Marie Carey didn't just unlock the power of atoms, she lived and died by them. Her legacy lives on in cancer treatment, nuclear physics, and the lessons of caution. Sometimes science is a double-edged sword, and few carried both edges more gracefully than Marie Curie. In the late 1950s, a new drug was quietly introduced in Germany. It was called thalidomide, marketed as a miracle cure for anxiety, insomnia, and morning sickness. It seemed like a gift to expectant mothers. It was non-barbituate, non-addictive, and best of all, over the counter. Soon, thalidomide spread across Europe, Canada, and parts of Asia. By 1960, it was in nearly 50 countries. But something strange started happening. Newborns were being born with missing or severely shortened limbs. Some had flipper-like hands, Others had no arms or legs at all. Doctors were baffled. The birth defects were severe, but mothers had experienced healthy pregnancies. Eventually, they traced the cause. Thalidomide crossed the placenta and disrupted fetal development. By the time the alarm was raised, it was too late. Over 10,000 children had been affected. The drug was pulled from shelves, but damage control had just begun. Pharmaceutical companies denied responsibility at first. Lawsuits followed. Governments got involved. The U.S. had narrowly avoided the crisis, thanks to one skeptical FDA reviewer 
Frances Kelsey. Because of her, thalidomide never gained approval in the U.S. Today, survivors live with the impact, but many became powerful advocates. The disaster reshaped how we test drugs. It became the catalyst for stricter global drug regulations. And thalidomide? It never truly disappeared. In small doses, it's now used for diseases like leprosy and multiple myeloma, but only under tight controls. It's a haunting reminder that even good intentions, if unchecked, can spiral into tragedy. The thalidomide tragedy wasn't just about science. It was about trust and what happens when that trust is broken. In the 1920s, refrigerators were dangerous. They leaked toxic gases like ammonia and methyl chloride. To solve this, chemists invented something new, chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. They were non-toxic, non-flammable, and seemed like a miracle. Soon CFCs were everywhere, in fridges, air conditioners, hairspray, even asthma inhalers. But CFCs had a hidden problem. When released, they floated up, way up, into the stratosphere. There, sunlight broke them apart. And the chlorine inside? It began breaking down ozone molecules. The ozone layer isn't just a science buzzword. It shields Earth from the sun's harmful ultraviolet rays. By the 1980s, scientists noticed something terrifying. There was a giant hole in the ozone layer right over Antarctica. The public was alarmed. Skin cancer rates were rising. UV levels were spiking. For once, the world took action, quickly. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was signed. It banned CFCs. Companies switched to safer alternatives. The ozone layer began to heal. But CFCs last a long time. Some are still floating up there decades later. It's a lesson in unintended consequences. We solved one problem by accidentally tearing a hole in the sky. Even miracles in science can leave scars. January 28, 1986, a cold morning in Florida. The Challenger Space Shuttle was ready for launch. It was supposed to be historic. The first teacher was going to space, but hidden inside the rocket boosters was a tiny flaw. The shuttle's boosters were sealed with rubber O-rings, designed to keep super hot gases from leaking out. But that morning, it was unusually cold, too cold for rubber to stay flexible. 73 seconds after liftoff, hot gases slipped past the seal. A fire pierced the fuel tank. The shuttle broke apart in midair. All seven astronauts on board were killed, live on national television. The cause wasn't a grand design failure, just one rubber ring that got too cold. Engineers had warned about this exact problem, but no one wanted to delay the launch again. The Challenger tragedy shook NASA. The shuttle program was paused. Trust was broken. Later, Nobel physicist Richard Feynman joined the investigation. He made the flaw visible with a simple demo. He dropped it, stiff and brittle, onto the table. The room fell quiet. Sometimes disasters don't start with explosions. They start with silence. A tiny overlooked detail can bring down giants. Once upon a time, scientists thought they could breed better humans, not through wisdom, but through forced sterilization. This idea was called eugenics, from the Greek meaning well-born. But what it really meant was control and exclusion. In the early 1900s, the United States became one of its loudest advocates. Yes, before Hitler, over 60,000 people in the U.S. were sterilized without consent. Many were poor, disabled, or simply misunderstood. Eugenics was wrapped in lab coats and jargon, but its core was cruelty, masked as science. In Europe, eugenics took darker turns. In Nazi Germany, it became state doctrine and a blueprint for genocide. But even after World War II, eugenics didn't die. It changed names. It put on new clothes. In Sweden, forced sterilizations continued into the 1970s. In Canada, into the 90s. Some victims are still alive today. 
Today we talk about CRISPR, designer babies, and perfect genes. It sounds different, but echoes still whisper. The lesson? Science without ethics is just another machine, one that forgets the human part. It began in secrecy, a wartime race to split the atom. The Manhattan Project, born from fear that Nazi Germany might create the ultimate weapon first. Thousands of scientists, technicians, and workers. Three secret cities, billions in funding. But hardly anyone knew the full picture. By July 1945, it was ready. A bomb, more powerful than anything in human history. The test was called Trinity. It worked, and it changed the world. Weeks later, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Over 100,000 dead instantly, more in the aftermath. The war ended, but the fallout had just begun. Radiation sickness, birth defects, environmental devastation for generations. Many who worked on the bomb didn't know the full effects. Some died from exposure, others lived with regret. The Cold War made things worse. More bombs, bigger bombs. Everyone braced for the unthinkable. The Manhattan Project built the bomb, but it also detonated an era of fear. In June 2014, Facebook quietly published a study. It was called Experimental Evidence of Massive-Scale Emotional Contagion Through Social Networks. Catchy title, troubling implications. Here's what they did. They tweaked the news feeds of 689,003 users. Some saw more positive posts, others saw more negative ones. None were told. It was an experiment in emotional manipulation. The question? Would your mood shift based on what you saw? The results? Yes, users exposed to more negative posts used more negative words. Facebook had nudged human emotion. Algorithmically, the backlash came quickly. Not because of what Facebook learned, but because no one had given consent. To Facebook, it was just A-B testing. To others, it was unethical experimentation on unwitting humans. Journalists, ethicists, and even some researchers were stunned. Was this science? or manipulation. Facebook apologized, kind of. They said they'd do better, but didn't really say how. The bigger lesson wasn't about sadness or smiles. It was about power. Who controls the feed controls what you feel. The algorithm didn't just learn emotions, it rewrote them. And for a brief moment, Facebook ran a psychological experiment on nearly 700,000 people, and no one even noticed. Thanks for watching. We hope you learned something strange, surprising, maybe even a little unsettling. Science doesn't always get it right, but it always leaves a story behind. See you in the next one.